Okay, we are live again for another one of my uh, studio days. Welcome back. Thank you for joining me. Um, now I've got three pieces that need the same uh, treatment. So I've got this large Quetzal piece. This bird here is, uh, is called a Quetzal. Uh, sometimes it's called the resplendent Quetzal, so it gives you an idea of how fancy and colourful it should be by the time it's finished. But here, which is the Guitar Eye Waterfall, there is some land either side that I want to have as a kind of wheat field or daffodil field, which is seen in one of my other paintings and it's a recurring theme. It's required on this larger piece with a quetzal and also in these pieces that appear slightly more finished. Okay this one here you can see that there's this space here where a river comes through and through the guitar into this kind of waterfall. I am in two minds whether or not to put a leaf there to break up the break up the image a little bit. So that might come afterwards when I'm experimenting with greens. And with this piece here, which to my mind is the most finished, there's this little area behind the guitar, the guitar flower on this side. And that will be as far as I want to take it uh, on live stream uh, with some of these pieces. I have to kind of drop out a little bit before they're finished. Uh, otherwise, there would be copies of these works uh, available and I do want to benefit from them commercially if I can. So I want to share with you up to the maximum point that I, that I can uh, before um, I finalise the piece. So that's it. Uh, not sure which one to begin with. Probably, probably the larger piece. Now, it's quite big. You can see it like this way. So if I rotate it, portrait like it's supposed to be, it doesn't fit into this screen the way I've got it set up. Um, at the moment, but that might change. Okay, I'm using my number two Rosemary & Co. Sable Blend Series 771 uh, Synthetic Sable Rigger. Okay, what a long title. So, just my skinny drawing brush. Uh, I've begun to add linseed to my mixing water and linseed on the table in order to encourage me to work the correct way, which is fat over lean. So in my water, I have a water mixable linseed and I also have a little well of it on the mixing palette off screen. I am planning on getting uh, a separate camera so you can see that, but I'm in no rush. Uh, all in due time. So, where to begin? So I feel that it should be a little bit higher up than where the base of the guitar is at the moment. So possibly maybe about here and that will leave space for my high, um, strongest yellow. That's it. I feel as if I'm ready now. And it's just a matter of blocking in. So 
So this uh, channel is guitar art therapy, guitar art and the therapeutic value of creativity. It's basically, you know, live streaming as a way of recording my studio practice, but also it incentivizes me to, to actually do it. Uh, many times I feel I could just not bother. So today was one of those days. I am psyching myself up and trying to force myself to keep in this habit. Uh, although I do love the painting sessions, uh, oftentimes I just lack the energy to, to push on. Having said that, I do find the sessions, you know, deeply rewarding. And anything that is good for self, that's anything that is good for your health, good for your body, your body responds positively towards it. And that includes a sense of um, self-esteem. Oh wow, this has gone on quite orangey today because this is the yellow ochre next to that yellow ochre. So, um, it's the same paint. But on the screen there, I'm noticing it coming across as being more orangey today. And it's the same paint. And so, uh, I'm thinking of this as the filling a very thick filling in the center of a sandwich uh, but the two outer parts are going to be cadmium yellow light and burnt umber and I want the the lightest color to transition into this yellow tone this mid tone and the darker color to transition as well. So here we are. I'll have to come down a little bit here to this portion. And there you can see what I've done is I've continued the yellow ochre. A reasonable amount of paint, a reasonable amount of the linseed oil. So it's very gloopy on this one. Which is a curious thing because this one is, you know, this is quite oily here, whereas some parts are very, very thin. So, eh. Uh, in terms of managing the artwork, it's already at different stages. And so, um, I want to make sure that I manage uh, and maintain the fat over lean. But when so many different parts of the painting are at different stages, Sometimes it's a little bit difficult to keep track of it all. Okay, so I'm moving the artwork up so you can see that I want this kind of wheat field. And so I've turned my brush around the wrong way. And sometimes I use a, a, an embossing tool. Derwent has a, a nice embossing uh, set. which I often use. And here what I'm doing is I'm scraping back to the very thinnest of the layers while I notice that I haven't applied any paint material. This flat is good for scooping the paint up off the, off the palette. So I'll put that there knowing that I can reshape the shoulder. 
if I want to. Thicken it up with some actual paint. That's so very oily. There we go. Much better. So, um, yeah, I was saying um, Derwent have embossing tool set uh, in their drawing set. And so that's very useful for scraping back to the very thinnest layer, which was the stain, the kind of olive and umber stain that was put on right at the very start to basically tone the canvas board. So that was yellow ochre, and now burnt umber. And what I'm trying to do is create a, a shaded area by blending in. better. Okay, so and this is working wet and wet. The more you work the area, the more that the colours are combined. But again I'm still going to scratch back to give that texture. transition up a little bit beyond this branch go on to do is create a separation here and here so we can see those areas separately and that's probably about as far as I want to go with that so scrape them back we'll lighten it because it will drag back to that earlier uh, stain. And I've been doing a bit of research today on pigments so it is possible to uh, read your paint tubes. This is a colour I haven't used yet but this is Viridian. You can actually read the technical information on the tube and I was doing a little bit of research um, before purchasing some more paints and it was all very interesting because I've been buying colours thinking that they were completely separate paints whereas they're combinations of pigment pigments um, that I already have so I could actually create the paint that I'm trying to buy using colours I already have. So I found it really, really interesting and perhaps I should share it um, more thoroughly on a separate um, live stream. Okay, and this is very, very uh, syrupy paint. And the people that paint with oil paint talk about, you know, um, the paint being very buttery. Well, that is the that's how it feels. So, very buttery paint. And again, just building it up, building up the tone so it's dark enough and thick enough to score into to create that texture. And by doing so, that also helps at this particular part of the painting. It helps to uh, transition the colours as well. 
So that's a little bit too regular, so we want to mix that up a little bit. So that it's not too mathematical. And let's see if we can go in with the very last dark amount. Yeah, so I was buying or uh, wanting to buy uh, greens like sap green or olive green, which um, was one of the colours that I used to stain this board. And <laughs> olive green is a combination of a black that I have and a yellow that I want. So, and I've already got black and yellow in my collection. So, I feel I could um, reduce the amount of paints that I'm using by being more selective in uh, the pigments that I choose. So I can get a multi-dividend from them. Okay, so that's it. That's the the yellow ochre was my mid value, the burnt umber was my darker value in this particular sandwich. So the burnt umber is coming in to sandwich the yellow ochre on one side, and then I'm soon going to bring in the a uh, uh, cadmium yellow light from the other side. So it'll be the other <laughs> slice of bread that's going to sandwich the yellow ochre in the middle. I may not be expressing myself the most clearly. Um, excuse me a moment. Thank you. I have explained that I won't be doing edits at all. Uh, anything that is time consuming or using up more of my precious energy um, is something I want to avoid. I want to be very, very stingy with my energy levels. So I'm back into the uh, off camera. I'm back into the um, the water mixable linseed oil and bringing that into the cadmium yellow light. To create quite a syrupy mix. And what I'm going to do is probably come as high here as to frame the side of the wing of the bird. This away. So. It's very, very easy to dirty yellow colours. It can be very Difficult to keep a pure yellow. They tint very, very quickly indeed. And so I will need to assess my um, palette management. In fact, there's a lot of things that I'm having to question myself about why I do the things the way that I do and see if I can make them more efficient. Or just better. So I don't do these um, live streams because I'm an expert passing on to you the correct way to do things. That just isn't the case. 
Uh, all I'm doing is recording what I would be doing if the camera wasn't rolling. Except I have to provide a commentary. Okay, so what I'm doing is I'm transitioning by dragging the wet cadmium yellow light down into the wet um, yellow ochre. And I have an idea on the, in my mind's eye, where about on the canvas this transition should stop. Probably about there. And the rest should just be a build up of those tones, tints and tones. That's quite dark. Probably belongs better there. Yeah, and now it's just um, blending them in. creating a scrofito texture. So I have spoken about scrofito before. So um, it is possible to retrace uh, what I've shared before by visiting the other um, live streams. And while I'm practicing doing them, uh, they're private. but will be released, uh, scheduled to be released on YouTube. And when they are, I'll be already be on to a different topic, a different project. But that project will probably be informed by the things that I'm learning right now, which is the way of you know studio practice. Some things that you do lead into and inform your next steps. I'm relatively happy with that. Let's see if I get in with a darker brush. Let's see if I can just draw a texture in and get away with that to uh, soften some of the texture marks. It's okay. Now similarly with this little one, it's the same idea. That I go in with yellow ochre. Having to be a little bit more cagey because of how, uh, first of all, how small the painting is, but but also to respect the previous bits of painting. I'm working with my face very very close to the surface and looking up and check that I'm not obscuring your view so you can see it. So yeah, I was saying I don't come to the live streams thinking that I know more or better than anybody who's listening in. I just want to paint for the good feelings it gives. And 
to create works that interest me. Like these ones here, I've been thinking about recently that our holiday to Costa Rica has unfortunately been cancelled due to COVID restrictions. I'm going to change the angle so I can approach this a little bit better and just double check that you can see what's happening here. Okay. Um, and so uh, I thought my desire to paint these was just to well, do a painted doodle to get practice with oils. Maybe also practice you know, live streaming and sharing um, my thoughts as they happen, which is a stream of consciousness, isn't it? When you think, you sort of um, do a meta narrative of why you think you're doing what you're doing. But recently I've been thinking that maybe these paintings, which are very much Costa Rican based, are to are, are serving to address the loss that not being able to go on holiday has had. Well, there's a really difficult bit there. That's really, really fine in there. So I maybe need to invest in some zero brushes. This is the smallest one that I've got in a very limited set of paint brushes. I've only got about eight paintbrushes. Um, and so, yeah, I think this is exercising that particular loss. It's serving that loss somewhat. And also, it's um, And because it's a collection of doodles and comes from the unconscious mind and is very, very personal, contains personal um, symbols and iconography, it's a self-portrait. So I think it's a self-portrait of someone who's missing <laughs> their opportunity to go to Costa Rica and uh, study hummingbirds. and such like. It's part of my daydream to actually sell up and move out to Costa Rica and just do this, just enjoy retirement out there. I'm young enough actually to enjoy a retirement, being medically retired due to ME. Um, so that all seems really improbable now because I think even the thought of the journey would be actually too physically demanding. So I would be able to fly out, but I would be several days trying to recover from it. So who wants to spend their holiday time recuperating in bed? What's the best angle for you to see this? Maybe that way. So So what is the summary? What am I trying to say? Well, I think that painting uh, largely happy paintings about Costa Rica 
is vicariously enjoying the holiday without leaving my own house. Can you see that? Okay. Yeah. So remember our sandwich, the yellow ochre is the the filling and the two slices of bread are different. We have a dark slice of burnt umber and we have a light slice of um, cadmium yellow. So this is going to be very very tricky here. Wish me luck. Okay, that is proving quite tricky. So here is the Derwent embossing tool, which is really for drawing. And I'm going to use that to scrape in and hopefully combine the colours. Without success, back in. Well, I suppose it's worked a little bit, a little bit there. Okay, and possibly a little bit here. Trying dabbing instead. Okay, I can see a little bit of shading going on. A little bit, and so. There's the very bright colour that I need. This cadmium yellow light. So yeah, cadmiums are quite toxic. So I wouldn't be doing any um, finger painting with them anytime soon. But there's another uh, yellow that I've seen, which doesn't seem to be quite so toxic and is still a very powerful yellow, is arillamide yellow. And it's available in a an acrylic form which may be a feature of the next project that I do. So if I just concentrate on this one for the moment. I've been learning about working wet and wet. And if we work completely wet and wet and in one go, eh, that's called a la prima. And it might be nice some time to have a go and see how much can be painted in a single sitting. Uh, one thing I remember about a little bit of research into Alla Prima is that, you know, it's three strokes of the brush and then you reload. So it's nothing like what I'm doing right now, which is repeatedly, you know, 
applying two colours on and then repeatedly blending them. I still want to get some of that little texture in so without damaging any of the underpainting. It seems to want to scrape back right to the very right to the very white colour of the board. And I'm beginning to wonder if this was one of my earliest attempts before I even uh, tried staining the board. Or maybe it's been stained so lightly that it's coming through uh, quite lightly like that. But there you are. I've got a transition from very light through the mid down towards a darker value. And uh, I've got the suggestion of some kind of texture in my very small space. Do I want to bring it over here? I'm not so sure. Uh, I think that would be far too uh, complex. And I like this hummingbird and that little background uh, the way it is. So that's that one. And there's only one more. Same size of canvas board as the one that we just worked, but this one, as you can see, is landscape, and the area to be worked is a much larger area indeed. So, since my brush is loaded up with them um, cadmium yellow light, I think I'm just going to go with that. I'm going to go with the yellow first of all. Right up to the olive. So, yeah, I find olive a very, very useful colour indeed. I like this colour. In terms of staining the board, um, it's a really good preparation for the base colour of a hummingbird. And hummingbirds are my thing at the moment. It's not the only thing that I do, but um, it's always been an ambition, and certainly one I said I would do in my retirement, is that I would concentrate on um, hummingbirds, painting hummingbirds. But these elasomorphs, as I call them, these kind of elastic thought, conceptual painting things um, with recurring imagery and uh, shapes are treating the hummingbird subject a bit like a cartoon. And no one would say that they were, you know, uh, fine art illustrations of exotic species. Uh, illustrations that they do for, you know, interpretive work for books, for identification books. So, no. Nowhere near that. The subject is being treated rather in a kind of naive folk art kind of cartoony sort of way um, and that's okay that's what it is at the moment i'm just um celebrating the joy of painting in this way and um yeah, thoughts about the subject matter Okay, now I can afford to come down a little bit more with this yellow before we start transitioning into the other yellow. So I'm down about there. So that's about here. If I just mark it across roughly, so that's fine. And the transition should start round about here. So the yellow ochre 
should be being introduced around about now. Okay. That paint is being a little bit stubborn. So some of the linseed water, the linseed loaded water has been used to help make the paint a little bit more workable. So I was looking at the technical details of this paint as well and um, water mixable oil because that's what we're using. Windsor & Newton water mixable oil can be mixed with water and it's the cheap way to do it. But the thing about it is that um, the paint will uh, allow the water to evaporate out of it much more quickly than if you use the thinner. The thinner is designed in such a way to give a longer working period. And evaporate more slowly. Um, which has the effect of lessening the problem of colour shift. I've mentioned colour shift a few times. So this is the... the um, you know, this colour, this light colour that I'm applying right now will dry darker. Now this is proven to be a tricky little, tricky little corner. I don't mind that I've lost the stamens of these little dangly parts of the flower. Uh, the anthers are big enough that I should be able to work round about them with my... Um, Uh, yellow ochre mix. But again, the water content is evaporating quite quickly in this. And so it's becoming quite tacky. Okay, so yellow ochre around the anthers of this imagined flower. Okay, we're losing the stamen about there. But we know that that's going to happen. I'm hoping that you can still see what's happening in the artwork. Okay, over to this other side and respecting the side of the guitar. So I may choose the angle. And hope that you can see it a little bit more clearly. Now, it's possible that I've made that mix too syrupy, sorry, too watery. So putting some more paint content into it, in the mix. And again, trying to paint round and respect those anthers. Down to about here. I'm turning it this way so I can see whether or not I'm digging into the top of the guitar there which I am a little but I don't mind that correction okay doing some dabbing of paint there as well 
so uh, with the light at an oblique angle to me, I can see uh, you know, how juicy this paint is. And um, the sparkles of light being reflected off it. Which is different from when you mix in the early stages when it's very, very thin and there's less kind of linseed in the mix. Right, I'll have to say that that was very, very tricky. Getting the colour right up to the, the red and not interfering with it too much. Similarly, this single one on this side of the river. Okay, tricky. But now the blending can begin, so I'm going to drag the, the two colours together. Drag the light into the yellow ochre and the yellow ochre in towards the cadmium yellow. And the mixing process is made easy by the linseed oil, making it very, very viscous, very juicy. And just a nice surface for the paint to um, receive the brush marks and mix the mix the two pigments. So that's the joys of oil, is that you get to get to blend. And depending on the concentrations of, you know, linseed or stand oil or other mixes that you may have created, you may even have a working time with oils, which includes several days. And so you can go away, reflect upon your work, and I say, nope, I want to make a change. So, I will admit I've been a very late comer to this um, particular party, the oil party, but I am being persuaded by these little projects and these little things. And this first part of the transition, so the light from the cadmium yellow light down into the yellow ochre, down into, switch over the brush, into the burnt umber which is coming up from here. And beside the side of the guitar there, you can see that, um, yeah, it's got a very warm kind of cocoa uh, aspect to it. It's uh, very nice. Okay, maybe to about there. But I haven't quite decided or resolved upon just what's happening in this space at all. So the other joy of uh, oil paint is the ability to draw over what you've already done. Okay, and I suspect another transition should happen about there. Okay, so when I look at that compared to the blue that was introduced to the, you know, the burnt umber and the French ultramarine and the other colours that were used to make up the side of the guitar to give that kind of um, uh, Indian rosewood appearance. Well, the burnt umber beside it has got a very red appearance. I don't know if the camera is actually picking that up. So. 
and with the yellow ochre up to the Cerulean River flowing into the back of the guitar. So what would you call it? A guitar tunnel waterfall. It's very difficult to describe. And we're into the blending. So yeah, one thing that I discovered in the research that I did to, today, I was talking about colours being already in my set, is that um, one of my absolute favourite colours is a yellow called Naples Yellow. And the base for this, um, you know, the pigment load for it is a combination of titanium white, which I've already demonstrated uh, through the course of this, these works. And yellow ochre. So titanium white and yellow ochre mixed thoroughly give me the Naples yellow that I love. And I paid a lot of money to get a tube that was Naples yellow, when in fact I already had them in my set. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, just use up, I'm just going to keep painting and as my paints need replenished, I'm going to be ordering them very cautiously, uh, looking at the you know, the pigment load, the pigment variety, uh, because that is described normally online, on the packaging and the technical information, which can be boring. But if you know that it works in your favour to choose your colours very, very carefully, you can have less colours, but the ability to mix the same amount, the same variety as um, presently with the paints that I own. Uh, I may not be expressing that to the best of my ability. Okay. But basically, I want to maximise my paints, streamline them, I think you get it. If you do, please explain it to me. <laughs> explain what I'm trying to say. Okay. So that's a reasonable transition, I think. Although that bit there looks a little bit heavy. So a little bit softer blending. There we go. I may continue to experiment with flower forms. Um, you may know that I'm looking into Henri Rousseau at the moment. So he may form the basis of another project and just maybe paint a, a copy of one of his paintings in his style and see what can be learned um, and what I can learn from myself by studying you know, someone I consider a master like that. So let's summarize where we are. This little painting has been given its wheat field and its transition through the cadmium yellow light, through the yellow ochre and down into the burnt umber. Similarly here on a smaller scale, and yet it was still possible to do the, the blending, or is it ombre? Uh, the blending that is here, and also do some of my um, uh, favourite technique, this graffito technique. It's my signature move, is this graffito. And here, 
it's just it all on a much larger scale. Now, this disc here was titanium white, uh, just used to fill in the circle that I had made. So I've made a circular halo for uh, something that I'm really interested in uh, in doing later. It's something um, that the Costa Ricans use to decorate their carts and their cart wheels with uh, heavily patterned. And I thought that would make an interesting halo around this uh, resplendent uh, bird. But as I did that, I was painting over the Costa Rican flag, the red, the white and the blue, and it all became softly blended in, in so much as we're looking through a kind of smoky bubble uh, through to the flag beneath that. It's not something that I wanted. It's not something that I'm going to keep. But now that I know that that happens, it's something that I may try to exploit uh, later on, that titanium white, though opaque, when it's painted over um, a surface that's had a day, you know, these colours here that have had a day to dry, uh, it doesn't completely blend them in. It leaves a little trace, a little memory of what they were before and could be used to create a kind of bubble smoky effect. Uh, why would that be useful to me? Well, I think nature is precious, is valuable and the ecological bubble could burst quite easily and so there would be a reason for incorporating that um, imagery into something which uh, celebrates the diversity of you know life on the planet so the artworks are um, very ecological uh, in nature but also as a device here as a design it's interesting um, it certainly stops the eye from wandering out there and it's going to frame this bird when it has its wings. Um, its wings, if we can just draw them in. Uh, its wings should be extended out the way. And so I sort of imagine it like this. But I don't know what the I don't know what the bird's wings look like. Are they fringed like this? I don't know. So I have to have a little I have to have a little look and see. So something a bit like that. And now the guitar perch bird looks a little bit like a totem pole. It's accidental but you know, um, sometimes these accidents are, um, they say something, they're useful, um, there's a lesson in them that needs to be figured out somehow. That's what I think. So the next uh, thing which will help me bring um, a number of my paintings to a conclusion is these hummingbirds have got a variety of different greens in them and very uh, shiny, sparkly, iridescent is what I'm looking for. I've done it with these two smaller paintings. I've had a go with limited success but a very steep learning curve about the colours that I've got on my palette and how they can be used to create this illusion of iridescence. But really, it's needed very, very much for the biggest painting of them all. This one here. And actually, I have to confess that uh, I am a little bit nervous because I'm very happy with this uh, olive patterning on top of this stain. Uh, this, rus this russet colour has been brought in, perhaps a little bit orangey the next time, 
but I quite like that. But what is the right amount of really vibrant green that is needed? So how much raw color to a desaturated color is needed? What is the correct balance? A small amount of raw uh, pigment uh, balances off a large amount of desaturated broken colors. Um, I'm not sure. And so I'm very cautious and a little bit nervous uh, about it. But what I do know is that the colors that create the iridescence in the hummingbirds are seen in a much larger scale and possibly in greater variety in the, the greens that go on inside the, um, the Quetzal bird. Uh, it is beautifully coloured and in my nemesis colour. So um, I did try to do a project on my nemesis colour, which is green. Uh, I find green very, very difficult. But on my YouTube uh, channel, um, uh, Guitar Therapy uh, on YouTube, uh, I've already uploaded a green finch project where I try and deal uh, with the problem of greens, the problem for me of greens. Uh, and so I'll be approaching this a little bit more confidently. And this is what I was saying earlier in this live stream as well, is that, um, you know, lessons learned in a previous work informs the next work. And so these series of elasomorphs, which you know have a lot of experimenting with green in it, come directly after that green finch project. And so each work informs the next work, creates the next steps for the research and the practice and the evaluation, and then the next steps that occur. So uh, I think tomorrow we will be mixing uh, quite a lot of greens. And hopefully this surface here, which has taken a reasonable amount of time to dry, uh, will be ready to receive those uh, greens. I may be taking them directly out of the tube or mixing them up using um, the blues that we've used already, which are French ultramarine blue, this one, and the cerulean blue, uh, along with the cadmium yellow light that we've already used. And that's it. I think that's it for today. I'm getting very tired. And my concentration is going. I'm going to stop live streaming uh, very soon. Just after I said thank you for joining me for uh, this live stream. Um, I hope that you found it useful and that it encourages uh, creativity wherever you find yourself, wherever you may be. Thanks for viewing and bye-bye.